My name is Will Steffen. I'm an Earth system scientist. So here's our reference period, the Holocene. This is now 100,000 years record of Earth's temperature. So you can see the last ice age, the ups and downs, but the general uh, decrease in temperature uh, going down to the depth of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago. But it's this last nearly 12,000 years of relatively stable conditions compared to an ice age uh, that's referred to as the Holocene by the geologist. This is when humans first developed agriculture, villages, cities, and we've thrived during this period of the Holocene. So what we wanted to do was to go back to 1750, it's a bit hard to see on all of these little graphs, but we wanted to pick up before the Industrial Revolution. So what would you measure if you wanted to quantify us, who we are and what we do? So we looked at population, economic activity, resource use, urbanization, globalization, transport, and so on. And what we saw when we plotted the data from 1750 or as early as we could get them were rem was remarkable. We thought we would see a nice even curve from 1750, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but we didn't. In virtually all of these, we see a little bit of an increase, not a whole lot happening, until this year, 1950, mid-20th century. And then we see all of these parameters taking off. And some of the more contemporary ones, like globalization, here we use international tourism, actually don't start before 1950. But in each one of these, we see a remarkable increase in the magnitude of these parameters, whether it's economy, whether it's resource use, and so on. So we said, indeed, there is something really unusual going on here in the human enterprise, starting in the mid-20th century. But then we said, we have to look at the other part of the word, the C-E-N-E, -E, which refers to the Earth system. Can we see any impact of these rapid increases in human pressures on the Earth system? And we did the same thing. We started from 1750, and we went to 2000, and now 2015. So what we did here was to look at six parameters which characterize the geosphere, the non-living part of Earth, the climate, ozone, ocean, acidity, and so on. And the bottom six are the biosphere, the coastal zone, the land, the ocean. So what you can see here when we look at the famous greenhouse gases, loss of ozone, atmospheric temperature, ocean acidity, we start to see that these are moving too. Not always precisely at 1950, but it's remarkable how many of them actually show changes in their rate around the mid 20th century. So we amassed an enormous amount of evidence from the scientific literature, from the observation agencies and so on. And we can say two things about these graphs. One is they are outside of Holocene norms. We can go back to the paleo record, the geological record, and look at what these look like for the past 12,000 years. These are all outside of Holocene norms. And the second thing we can say for sure is the major driver are human pressures, not natural variability in the Earth system. So now we can look at what's on everyone's mind these days, which is climate change. So if we look at the, the global temperature record from 1850 to the present, again, we don't see much change in the first part of this record. But again, from about 1950, or actually from the 1970s, there's a bit of a lag there, we see an exceptionally strong increase in global atmospheric temperature. And we know for certain that the dominant driver of this is human emission of greenhouse gases. So there's no doubt about that. But what we want to do is put this again in a Holocene framework. We want to go back all the time to our Holocene point of reference. So here is the last 2,000 years of the Holocene. For those of us of European background, this is the time of the Roman Empire. Here's the medieval warm period and so on. European invasion of Australia occurred right around here. European invasion of North America occurred right around there. But the thing is, the temperature, the global average temperature was extremely steady uh, and it only varied by one tenth of a degree either side of the norm. But this is that instrumental record of the last hundred years or so on the same time scale. So we can see how enormous the human influence is on our climate. And we can also say for sure that this is way outside of Holocene norms. We can look at the rates of change too. That, that last line there, if you just go back there, you can see how sharp that is. That's a spike in the temperature record. We can actually measure this. The rate of atmospheric CO2 increase, which is the major driver of that curve, over the past two decades is about 100 times the maximum rate during the last deglaciation, when CO2 went up from about 180 
to 260 to 280 parts per million. For the last half century, the global average temperature has risen at a rate about 170 times faster than that background rate over the last 7,000 years of the Holocene, and in the opposite direction. So again, these are unprecedented rates of change. And just a couple of months ago, the Geological Society of London put out a report saying that this current rate of carbon dioxide and temperature change is almost unprecedented in the entire history of Earth. That's 4.5 billion years. They can find only one time when climate changed faster, and that was when the asteroid struck Earth 66 million years ago, the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, and that was instantaneously, instantaneous. But all other records of changes in climate in Earth's 4.5 billion year history, none of them are as fast as the human-driven change of today. But we also need to look at the biosphere because the other big part of the Earth system is the living part, the biosphere. So if we look at how humans are transforming the biosphere, we can look at a big synthesis report done just two years ago in 2019 that looked at all the evidence we have of how the biosphere is changing and how humans are changing. A number of important conclusions were drawn in this. I'll only put three of them up here. One is nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. So just as in climate, we are driving extinctions, changing land, polluting the ocean faster and faster. About one million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades, and that would amount to the sixth great extinction event in the entire history of Earth. The web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed, and you can see that here in Australia with the land use change, with the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, with the massive fires. It's hammering our biosphere on this continent. But the Earth has had five mass extinction events in the past, usually associated with changes in glaciers or the meteorite strike 66 million years ago, which was actually, sorry, which was actually the most recent one, which was here. That's the one that knocked out the dinosaurs. But the one we're entering into now will be the sixth great extinction event in the history of the planet. This is an amazing statistic that really hammers home how much we dominate the biosphere. If you could weigh everything, every living animal on land that has a backbone, vertebrate. So that's mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, everything on land. You would find that our domesticated animals, our pigs, cattle, chooks, account for two thirds, 67% of all that mass. We humans, just our own bodies, we account for 30% of the mass. And all wild creatures, whether they're kangaroos, elephants, zebras, what have you, account for 3%. So you add up all the wildlife on Earth, all the kangaroos that are living, all the African wildlife, all the bison in North America, etc. We humans weigh 10 times more than that. And this is what he's saying, global homogenization of flora and fauna. We're mixing everything. Everything's becoming more monotonic. Humans were commandeering 25 to 40 percent of the net primary productivity. That's what the whole biosphere produces every year. We're commandeering up to 40 percent of that. And we're mining fossil net primary productivity, coal, oil, and gas, and burning that at an enormous rate. We're now directing the evolution of other species through genetic engineering. And we're increasingly interacting the biosphere with the technosphere. Think of pollutants, plastics, radioactive materials, and so on. A colleague of mine, Jaya Savitsky from the United States, put this together. So here we're going back 12,000 years up to the present. So the Holocene began about there. So here we're looking at things like human population, because humans were around in the Pleistocene, cumulative global energy use, and GDP economy. Look at how flatlining that is until right at the end of the Holocene when population goes up. This little shaded area here is 1950 onwards. Have a look at what happened after 1950. That's, that's just phenomenal, how much the human enterprise exploded. So if we just look at this area out a little bit more, there's the 1950 there. And if we look at, here's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we see that things started creeping up, but it was really from 1950 that population, energy use, and GDP really exploded. But I want to jump back now to a new system perspective and talk about where we might be going. It's a trajectory, a fast trajectory away from the Holocene, probably away from the Pleistocene as well. So we can look at the, the temperature record, and I've showed you this before. This is the, the influence up till now, about a 1.1 degree temperature rise. By the way, the difference between the last ice age and the Holocene was about four degrees. 
in global average temperature. So we're now a quarter of the way in terms of changing the temperature, but in the opposite direction, making it hotter. These are the climate model projections going out to 2100. This was actually published in the fifth report of the IPCC. So these start at 2005. This is the low emission scenario. That's the high, some in between. So anywhere from another one degree up to four degrees. But the point is, this is only one century. And it's spread out like this so the curves don't look too ominous. But let's put it on this long time scale. So here's the time scale. There's 1900. There's 2000. 2100's here. On this temperature scale, what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. This is why the geologist is saying that never before in 4.5 billion years of Earth history, apart from the asteroid strike 66 million years ago, have we seen temperatures rise like this. This is, again, a remarkable trajectory in the future. So here's where we are now. You can see the 1.1 here. These are the Paris targets, 1.5 to 2 degrees. So we're trying to keep temperatures somewhere within that range. But this is where we're going now. If we just keep emitting like where we are today, Australia, other countries keep pretty much doing what we're doing, we're going to hit at least three. And a worst case scenario, of course, if we use all the fossil fuels we can get our hands on, is four and a half or five degrees. So that's what we face. And when you look at it in the proper time scale, you can see what an emergency this actually is. But what I want to talk about now is to go back to the Earth system and how it behaves and talk about this concept of tipping points. I'll go into what they are in a little bit. But the issue I want to point up here is that we think that many of these tipping points are vulnerable to temperature rises in the span of 1.5 to 3 degrees. And we're approaching 1.5. We'll probably pass 1.5 in a bit over a decade. So we need to take this seriously. And the problem is, once we start tipping them, they will push the Earth system on their own up to the higher temperatures. We won't be able to stop it. So there is a, sort of a point of no return in this trajectory that you really don't want to push the Earth system past or will be in real trouble. So that's something we need to know much more about. What do these tipping points look like? Well, we can actually map them. So here are a number of them. They come basically in three types. Big ice sheets here, the Antarctic ice sheets. There's Greenland and summer and winter sea ice. They also come in the form of circulation, like the jet stream. This is a destabilization of the jet stream. That's a tipping point. So that's already showing we're, we're approaching that one. And then there are the big biomes, the boreal forest, the Amazon forest, coral reefs, and so on. So a group of us published a paper about a year and a half ago in December 2019 saying, what do we know now? Because we can actually look at a lot of observations about these tipping points, where we are today, how are they changing? And here's what we see. Greenland ice sheet, it's losing ice and the rate is accelerating. West Antarctic ice sheet, ice loss, again, accelerating. Arctic sea ice in the northern hemisphere summer, that's shrinking more and more every year. Permafrost is starting to thaw. And ominously, the Atlantic circulation is slowing down and has been for half a century. But here's how they are connected. As the Arctic sea ice reduces in area to the, during the Northern Hemisphere summer, when it's under, in sunlight 24 hours a day, that is increasing the heating of this region because it's absorbing more sunlight. That is accelerating the loss of ice from Greenland, which sits in the far north. That is pouring more fresh water onto the North Atlantic Ocean as it melts. That is slowing the Atlantic circulation. That is reducing rainfall over the Amazon, causing more droughts, more fires, more carbon goes back up into the atmosphere, and it accelerates the whole process. That's what a so-called tipping cascade looks like. And we can actually see it start to unfold now, all the way from the Arctic sea ice to the Amazon rainforest. So we made a very important point in this paper. If damaging tipping cascades can occur, and we, we think there's enough evidence that we have to take this seriously, and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is indeed an existential threat to civilization. No amount of economic cost-benefit analysis is going to help us. So that's where we stand, I think, pretty much today in 2021. We can see a lot of instabilities beginning to grow in these tipping elements. We can see some connections between them. We haven't yet hit the, do the global tipping cascade yet, but we're concerned that somewhere between a degree and a half and three, we could tip the whole planet. We published an earlier paper which tried to put this into this little cartoon. It's a stability landscape. Where these are stable states of the Earth's system. This is an ice age. And this little valley here is the Holocene. And so over the last 1.2 million years or so, and the Earth is just oscillated, rolling up and down between the ice ages and the warm periods. 
And that's been triggered by changes in Earth's orbit, fairly regular changes. So about every 100,000 years, the Earth gets bumped up into a nice warm period, which is good for us humans and a lot of our colleagues, uh, the mammals and so on. That's the Holocene. But already today, we're pushing the Earth away from the next ice age. In fact, we think we've already missed the next ice age. That may be a good thing, by the way. But now we're moving over into this very shallow area that's ill-defined, which means there's a lot more variability in the climate. It's not in a stable system. The Earth is actually moving. But we think we're very soon going to pass this fork, where once we get these tipping elements going and degrade the biosphere even more so it's absorbing less carbon, we could hit this planetary tipping point. And this would take us into what we call hothouse Earth. That's the four or five degree hotter world that the IPCC has as its highest emission scenario. The difference we make is that you may not need human emissions to get you to hothouse Earth. You may get human emissions to trigger tipping points, and they will take you to hothouse Earth. The other option is to meet the Paris Accord, start regenerating the biosphere, living in different ways that we look after the planet, as our indigenous colleagues have done for thousands of years, called Earth System Stewardship, and park the Earth in what we call stabilized Earth. I think there's a very big difference uh, between those two fundamentally different approaches. One of them is trying to influence this complex system we call the Earth System and try to manage it or manipulate it or something. I think that's exceptionally dangerous because this is the most complex system we've ever confronted, we've ever tried to, to learn. Earth System Science is incredibly difficult and challenging, and we're only scratching the surface. I don't think anyone, any Earth System science, scientist can say with any reasonable confidence what will happen if we try geoengineering. Um, it's, and most of the geoengineering are designed around simple cause-effect logic. And in fact, you are intervening in an incredibly complex system that we don't understand. On the other hand, going back to indigenous values, looking after country is actually understanding that we live in a very complex system that has its own dynamics and its own inbuilt stability uh, in, in, in these geological epochs like the Holocene. So our job is to um, look after that, look after country to make sure we don't disturb it and we benefit from it. So uh, in climate change, the opposite of geoengineering would be drawdown, which would be to use biological means or others to draw CO2 back out of the atmosphere and put it back down to where it came from underground, in plants, and so on. Um, and that would be reducing the pressure on the system and allowing the system then to re-equilibrate. So that's very different then from the geoengineering approach. You can use an engineering approach to look at this too, in terms of intervention times and reaction times. So what do we mean by that? What's our reaction time? You hear more and more countries saying, we will commit to net zero emissions by 2050. It's becoming a common mantra. So here's 2050, and they want to get net zero emissions. So what emissions are left by 2050 are balanced by negative emissions uptake, drawdown. So that's what a lot of countries are aiming for. But what about these tipping points I've just been talking about? At what time intervals may we start to tip them? We can start looking at them. Those are called the intervention times. How much time do we have left to stop a tipping point? Arctic sea ice, my guess is zero. We're probably at the tipping point now. And by 2025, it'll be clear that through its own momentum, it will become ice-free during summer in a few decades. And that's because the more it shrinks, the more it opens up dark ocean water, which means the more sunlight it absorbs, and that accelerates the rate of melting, which opens up even more darker ocean water, and you see the feedback loop. But the point is, all of these are shorter than the net zero by 2050 which means that we are at great risk, if this is what we think all we need to do is net zero by 2050, of initiating this tipping cascade. In fact, we could say, are we already losing control of the system? Because we already see many of these tipping points moving. So you need to use a risk analysis when you address these sort of questions. So where are we today? This is a pretty shocking image in my view. These are what's actually occurred in terms of human emissions in billions of tons of carbon dioxide should be carbon dioxide equivalent. But what I want to point out here is that, except for a few bumps like the global financial crisis and COVID-19, this has been an increase at an increasing rate. So we can look at what science has done in terms of IPCC reports, what policy has done in terms of Kyoto and Paris. There has been no demonstrable impact of any scientific research or any policy interventions yet. This curve simply keeps going up. 
Our challenge, of course, is we have to get it down exceptionally fast now. I've talked a lot about the climate system. I've talked about the biosphere, and of course, they are intertwined. But I want to talk now about humans and our systems. So this is an update that we published last year of the famous Bretherton diagram, named after Francis Bretherton, a NASA scientist who, in 1986, published a diagram like this connecting the atmosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere. So this is an engineering wiring diagram, but it glosses over enormously complex and important aspects on the human side, our cultures, our values, our beliefs, our institutions, our knowledge, like the science that I'm involved in, and a lot of my colleagues, and our technology. And I view it this way, as all of these things are forming a loop that drives production and consumption. And it's the big arrows coming out of this that are changing the Earth system. One of the big criticisms we had when we published these graphs that I showed right at the beginning of my talk of the human enterprise from 1750 onwards was we lumped all of humanity together. And a very valid criticism of that was that humans are not equal. We have enormous inequities throughout our global societies. We have the small, in population size, very wealthy countries that are consuming and producing an enormous amount of material. Then we have very large, in population, developing countries who consume far, far less and are far less responsible for the degradation of the Earth system. So we said, all right, let's put this to the test. Let's look at the data. So what we did on all of these graphs here was to look at the wealthy countries, the OECD countries in the darker shading. The intermediate ones are the rapidly developing countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And then all the poorer countries are the light shaded wedges. Just look at two, just look at two, population and GDP, because GDP is a good indicator of all the resources you use and all the other pollutants you shove into the Earth system. So from 1950, from the Great Acceleration, we see there has been some increase in OECD countries, but it's very little. Almost all the additional human population is in the so-called BRICS countries and the developing countries. But look at GDP. Look at this wedge, the dark one. This small population absolutely dominates human economic activity, human consumption, human production. So all the massive people who have been added to the global population have actually contributed very little. This is stark evidence, in my view, and in many other people's views, that equity issues cannot be swept under the carpet. That's absolutely unfair. Per capita, we're one of the biggest emitters. So are the other OECD countries. And this carries through all the other uh, indicators here. And we look at the evolution of income inequality within the wealthy countries. This is a very interesting one, in my view. So we can go back from 1900, and we can see that this is now looking at equality. We have fairly high levels of inequality. So we're looking at the top 1% of the population. What percentage of the wealth income do they co-op? They co-opt about 20% back during the Roaring Twenties. Same in English-speaking countries, same in Europe, same in Japan. The two world wars and a Great Depression evened this out. So everything evened out by 1950s or so on. But look what's happened since then. Japan and Europe have kept far more equal societies whereas the English-speaking world has become far less equal. We're concentrating wealth in the hands of a very few. The U.S. is by far the worst, and I think if we can be proud of anything here, it's Australia is actually the best so far. Although you can see that our trajectory is creeping up towards more inequality. Now this is important because we can look at health and social problems. This is some excellent work by Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson. So things that are not related to poverty, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, obesity, that's actually more in the wealthy countries, mental illnesses, and so on. So what we can do is look at the OECD countries and look, just plot the uh, index of these health problems, worse at the top, better at the bottom. This is low inequality. So these are more equal countries like Japan, high the USA. Look at how tight that correlation is. The more unequal your society is in terms of income, the more social and health problems you have. A very, very tight correlation, except for the US, which is anomalously bad. But here's Australia and New Zealand and the UK. But the usual suspects are the best, Japan, Sweden, Norway, the Nordics and Japan. These two gentlemen have done an, an excellent job of putting all this together in what they call the systems view of life. 
So they look at the Earth system all the way down to our biological systems, all the way to genetic systems, life itself, a unifying vision. And they have made a profound statement that our world today is dominated by an economic system with disastrous social and environmental impacts. They call it predatory capitalism because it's predatory on the physical climate system by dumping all our pollutants in the atmosphere, and it's certainly predatory on the biosphere. And they note that we are the only species on Earth who destroys its own habitat, threatening countless other species with extinction in the process. No other species actually does that. And they really say, why are we doing this? But there are some really interesting, innovative people out there thinking of, how do we deal with this? This is Kate Rayworth from Oxford University, an economist who works with Earth system scientists quite closely. And she's developed what she calls donut economics. And she says, what we need is a social foundation. Everyone agrees, whether you're a, a free market capitalist or a socialist, that you want to have healthy food, clean water, good health, you want to have education, resilience, energy, and so on. So this defines a well-functioning human society. But notice that she puts in things like social and gender equity, voice, resilience, and so on. So these social issues are just as important as the economic ones. But here's the key. She says there is an environmental ceiling on planet Earth. It's not infinite. We must stay within a stable climate. We must allow fresh water to flow around the planet and so on. These nine indicators for the ceiling are the so-called planetary boundaries. So this is her idea of a safe and just operating space for humanity. This is the way we should organize ourselves. I'll just put three of the main points. What does this economy look like? First of all, it's systems thinking. It's not this very simplistic GDP logic that we use today. Produce more, consume more. That's really kindergarten type thinking. She says we need dynamic complexity in our economy, in our societies. They need to build and develop and maintain equity by their design. Right now, equity is achieved, even in the Scandinavian countries, by taxing people and redistributing. So what she's saying is, we actually need to design an economy where you don't need to do that. It actually generates equity by the way it's designed. And it regenerates the biosphere by the way it's designed. Absolutely the opposite of what we do today. So there are good thinkers, but they're saying we really have to change directions. Philosophers have gotten into the act. This is Dipesh Chakrabarti, a colleague of mine from the University of Chicago. And he says our society is based on a human-centric approach. It's all about us. It's all about getting wealthy. It's all about consuming more. It's all about traveling around the world and so on. But the Anthropocene demands a zoocentric or life-centric approach. He's got this beautiful turn of phrase saying what we need is an epochal consciousness because we are changing the epoch of planet Earth. And he says we're stuck, even in academia, in departmental thinking. That's a big problem. I'm going to close by the longest continuous civilization on planet Earth, indigenous Australians. As far as we know, they've been here at least 65,000 years and perhaps more. They're the only society that I know of that's gone through the Ice Age Holocene transition intact on probably the toughest continent on the world to do that. There's a lot of wisdom embodied in Indigenous Australians, and I think they have some very good pointers for how we need to go forward in the 21st century. This is a quote from an elder from the Noongar people and a very good book called Elders' Wisdom from Australia's Indigenous Leaders. Noongar people are from WA, down I think just south of the Perth Ridge. But here's what she said. We're only here for a short amount of time to do what we've been put here to do, which is to look after country. We're only a tool in the cycle of things. Notice that they already knew about cycles, not linear cause-effect stuff, cycles. We go out into the world and help keep the balance of nature. There's balance, all right? We don't exploit it just to keep increasing our GDP. Our, the, our goal is to keep the balance. It's a big cycle of living with the land and then eventually going back to it. So I'm going to close there. Thank you very much.